in light of what tomorrow is, does everybody know what tomorrow is? No, it's my birthday. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's the 4th of July, also known as Independence Day. Does anybody know why we're celebrating tomorrow, other than Ben? <laughs> Anna? Yes and no. What happened on July 4th in 1776? Not Josiah, he knows. Yes. Good job. I have two people who know history. The Declaration of Independence. So what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit about the Declaration of Independence and the biblical reason why it was written and the biblical principles in it. Because we talk about the founding of this nation being godly, how God founded this nation for his plans and his purposes. But Still, I think mentally, and I've even realized this about myself, so often I've still separated the documents that are part of the founding of this nation from the Bible as far as I don't see a connection between the two, but there is a connection between the two. I'm not putting those documents up in the same credibility as the Bible, but a lot of the stuff that was written, the principles came out of Scripture. Okay? And don't listen to these people who say the founding fathers were all Masons, da 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 Listen, I tell you what, I read the writings of these people, and maybe at some point in time later on in their life, they fell away from God, whatever, I don't care. Well, I mean, I do care, but, but in the context of this, it doesn't matter. Because at the time when this stuff was written, these are God-fearing people who were being used by God for a divine purpose, and we're going to see a little bit of that tonight. Amen? Okay. So I want to start by... Uh, talking to you guys a, a little bit about the events leading up to the Declaration of Independence and why it was written. And uh, we're, again, this is not a full history lesson here. So those of you who are history buffs, and I'm going to miss some details, that's intentional, okay? Because we could be here all night talking about this, okay? But I'm just going to give you kind of an overview. And if you find the subject fascinating, which I do, especially when there's not a test involved afterwards, it's hard to enjoy, to me, it's hard to enjoy history when the only thing I can think about is what's going to be on the test. So, does anybody relate to me in that? Yeah, everybody. Okay, good. So, I thought I, thought I was alone. Because I, I, I have had a number of friends who were like, oh, I love history. And I'm like, I hate it. It's not because I hate history. I hate the tests. I don't want to remember the exact day that some person, I can't even pronounce their name, did something. I just want to know that they did that thing and how important it was. You know? All right, so one of the first things that led up to this was the French and Indian War. This was a seven-year war between the, with the American and British colonies fighting against the French and Indian colonies. The Americans and British won, but at a high price. Britain spent much uh, resources, money, food, uh, soldiers uh, on the war, and the colonists fully participated in the war uh, themselves, so they had their own losses as well. But the British, after the war, turned to the colonists and said, all right, you guys got to pay for that, as if it was their issue. Now, the colonists are, are, are under the leadership of Britain. They're supposed to be essentially part of Britain. They're, they are a part of Britain. They're under the authority of Britain. They're supposed to be under the protection, the provision of Britain. How many of you know if, if the state of California is overrun by a bunch of Russians or whatever. And then the federal government sends the, you know, the military in to fight them off to keep California from falling into the ocean from all the extra weight being on... No, I'm kidding. Uh, the federal government is not going to turn to the state of California and say, you got to pay for that. It doesn't make any sense, right? Because we're all one nation. But that's not how Great Britain looked at it. They looked at it as, you guys are just privileged to have any affiliation with us, and we're just milking you for everything we can get out of you. And we'll see a little bit how bad it got as it goes on. So later on, British put in, uh, in trying to pay for this, they put in the Stamp Act, which taxed the colonies on every piece of paper they used. 
the colonies disapproved of this because the British did this without the approval of the colonial authorities. They just completely usurped authority, went all right around them and said, we're instituting this tax whether you like it or not because you guys got to pay this bill. Uh, then a big catalyst towards uh, violence breaking out was the Boston Massacre, which basically what happened here is there is a lot of tensions because the soldiers were in the schools, they were taking up jobs, they were, they were just, they, were, they felt like an invading foreign force that was being forced upon the colonists. And then there was a, a dispute that was breaking out in the town and then, and uh, between the soldiers and the colonists, and there were some, you know, little rocks being thrown, not like stones, like you think, it's like, ah, gonna, just like little, just, they're just doing their thing, whatever, probably spitting, all that, all that good stuff. And, and then the church bell goes off. Now, normally when the church bell goes off, that's because of a fire. So then the church bell goes off, somebody yells fire, and the soldiers start shooting. And I, I believe it was about five people that were killed and six were injured in this. Well, I mean, that happens, and, and all kinds of craziness breaks loose. So then the colonial uh, leaders met for the First Continental Congress. And, oh, hold on. Before that, I skipped, I skipped a point. So in response to this and the, and the taxes that were being forced upon them, uh, some of the colonists poured a massive amount of tea into the Boston Harbor. And we have the original Boston Tea Party. It was in protest to this tyrannical government. Uh, the British responded to this by shutting down the Boston Harbor until the price of the tea was paid for, hoping to make an example of the group. But this actually stirred and unified the colonies closer to the place of war. So then we have the first Continental Congress that met in response to all this and laid out the first Bill of Rights and a list of grievances to send to the king. They're saying, hey, listen, all these things are happening. We don't think these things, we don't think you approve of these things. We don't think that, that we think that you're a man of character, that it, this stuff is beneath you. So we want to let you know. They're trying to be very integral. They're not just whining and say, hey, bozo, get on, get on the throne and do something. And uh, so then and tensions continued to mount as the British tried to come and take a stash of ammunition and weapons from a small town outside of Boston. And they sent, and uh, the colonists found out about this, and they sent a man by the name of, you may have heard of him, Paul Revere, to go up into a tower and to tell them, hey, are the British coming by land or are they coming by sea? And then, we, of course, we get that thing, the British are coming, the British are coming. <laughs> Got that, I saw that cartoon or something at some point in time. But those things continued to escalate. And so the, the colonial leaders had to make a tough choice. They had... Many different events had occurred, and we're going to read about some, a little bit more of those when we get into the, the Declaration of Independence itself. But many of those had occurred, uh, many of these kind of events had occurred, and they had sent plea after plea to the king saying, hey, dude, come on, we, we were sent over here with certain rights. As citizens of Great Britain, we're supposed to have certain rights. You're overriding them. You're trampling it, you're removing them, you're taking our laws and you're just doing whatever you want with them or completely ignoring them, just thing after thing after thing after thing. So they said, you know what? We have no choice. We've got to separate ourselves and become our own nation. And what they recognized is although the Bible is extremely strict about the need for us to submit to authority and, what God, and the Bible says that what God has put together, let no man separate. The Bible also clearly says that all authority comes from God and God puts everyone in authority. It doesn't mean that everyone who gets the right of authority is the will of God. Hitler was not the will of God, but no one can get authority without the consent of God. And again, that doesn't mean he approves, but all authority comes from God. The scripture clearly says that. So what they recognize this, but even, even in the midst of this, there's also, there's still, it's, there's still a condition. At a certain point, after the authority has become abusive to the person under, the, under authority, the person under authority has the right to remove themselves from underneath the abusive authority. 
And what, one of the things I just really want to highlight tonight is how slow these people were, though being an entire ocean away from their authority, to separate themselves from the authority. How much they submitted and complied to the authority in the midst of abuse before they finally said, this is, we can no longer submit to this. This was not a, you made us mad, we just want to do our own thing. This was a, we believe it is right and moral under, in the fear of God to remove ourselves so we can do our job as authorities over here and protect the people under our authority. Authority that was given to them by Great Britain. So, on July 4th, 1776, the Second Continental Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence. Now, I want you to think about this. I want you to just paint this picture in your mind. Before, the, before this day, before the United States of America, before the Declaration of Independence was written, before these events, every government in history, the standard, the normal, was tyranny. The normal was dictatorship. The normal was socialism. There was no freedom in the world. Freedom was something that was dreamed of but was not a reality for anyone except the very few elite who were in charge. The life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness was a language that they didn't copy from anywhere. They invented it. That was not found anywhere. They didn't copy Great Britain's model. They learned from it, from the mistakes. But they didn't, co- they, there was no model to copy. They were pioneering in the truest sense of the word. And I be- one of the reasons, actually, I believe this is one of, if not the biggest reason why the founding of America was a divine act of God. Because God created us with certain inalienable rights, He created us all equal. He desires for us to be free. Jesus came and died for us on the cross for our freedom. Freedom from sin. And so God, I really believe, though these people were not perfect, I believe God, despite the imperfections of the human vessels through whom whom he chose to work, founded this nation according to his plans and his purposes because, because, of the precedence that it would set to having a free people. Because I tell you what, this nation has become the largest funder of the gospel around the world in the history of the world. That is no accident. That is because of freedom. This nation has sent more missionaries into the world than any other nation of the world. That is uh, in the history of the world. That is no accident. That is because of freedom. The freedom of Religious expression and speech has allowed ministers and musicians and singers to be raised up that have impacted greatly for the kingdom of God. With as many faults and things that we do have in this nation, make no mistake, God founded this nation. And God has a plan and purpose for this nation, and he's not done yet. Amen? Amen? You know, some people say, well, America's finished, da, 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 da. And I say, who are you to decide when the judge of the earth should put down the gavel and say it is done? America is not finished yet. It is not finished until God says it's finished. Amen? Also, do, do you realize that the first, when, when the first president of the United States transferred power to the second president of the United States. That was the first peaceful transference of power outside of family bloodlines in the history of the world. You talk about setting a new precedence? Never before in history had there been such a uh, peaceful transference of power that was outside of family bloodlines. Every other time it was by violent takeover. Hello. We don't think about these things because we're like, oh yeah, president election, you know, it's so normal. That was, it was alien. It had never been done before. 
had never been done before. Hallelujah. All right, let's read. Let's read some of the, the, the Declaration of Independence. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the clauses which impel them into separation. So what is this saying? This is not just them being fancy. What they're, what they're talking about here is saying, this is a declaration of, we're, this, the whole purpose of this document is to tell you that we're saying goodbye to your kingship and why. That's basically, that's what the saying is. Like when, said, when we get to, in the course of human events, when basically in such a time as this, when it has become not just desired, but necessary for us to separate ourselves. We also feel that it is, that it is our obligation to tell you in writing why we are doing so. We're not just going to do so and say, forget you. But out of respect and honor for the authority that God has given you, we're going to tell you the reasons why we think under God we are allowed to do this. I just, I love, if you read it and you look at it for what it really is and what it's saying, I love, there's just such a profound respect for authority, even ungodly authority that's here. And I believe that's one of the reasons why God has blessed this nation so much is because this nation was not founded out of rebellion, not founded out of needless violence, but it was founded out of a necessity, breaking forth out of a tyrannical government and with respect to the end. All right. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. Someone say amen to that. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments and institu uh, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the cons consent of the governed. So we're saying in order for these rights to be secured, in order for them to be protected, the government has to serve the people, not the other way around. That's what that's saying. That when any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, what ends? Destructive to the rights that are given to us by God. It is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. He's saying basically, we believe that it is the right of any people that is under a tyrannical, abusive government that is taking away the God-given rights because no authority has the, has the right to override the word of God. Amen? So they're saying, you're, you're, overriding the, you're trying to override the word of God. You're taking away our rights. So we're saying we have the right to establish a government that is built upon protecting those God-given rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But it wasn't just that. It was also freedom of, of religious expression because the Church of England back home ran it so much, so many things and was so perverted. And the Church of England was ran by the government and they said no we can't have this we've got it with the 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 the, sep, the the quote separation of church and state which is not in the constitution it's in another document it's in a letter was is intended it, it comes out of this principle that the gov that the it's the people who the government is serving not the other way around and the government the separation of church and state is hey the church we can do what we want, government, you got to stay out of it. But it doesn't mean that we got to stay out of your business. Okay? Hallelujah. Is this all right tonight? No, it's a little different, but I want to, I'm going to edumacate you all. Edumacation happening right now. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed 
for light and transient causes. Basically, we're, we're not saying, we're, we're not just cavalierly doing this. We're not just saying, oh, we're, we just don't like you, so we're, we're, we're dumping you. So governments that have already been established, God established authority, should not be overrun or altered or separated from for light causes, for, for a light reason. It needs to be a very, very serious matter of abuse in order for this to happen. So if you put it in context of something like, like uh, a, a relationship, you don't break off the relationship because they said a mean word to you. you break off the relationship because of there's, there's actual abuse happening. Okay, same kind of deal. Governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. This is talking about the nature that we all have. We, it's, I like what uh, John Maxwell says. He says, until the, the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change, things will stay the same. Until sitting in that chair hurts bad enough that it's going to hurt less to stand up, you're going to sit in that chair. Right? Same, same basic principle. That's, that's, that's what it's talking about here. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute uh, despotism. Basically saying you ticked us off. <laughs> uh, it is their right, it is their, and it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance from these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations. A usurpation is when they're going around the established authority of the colonies. All having in direct object, all of these injuries and usurpations have in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over the states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. So they're saying, we, you are acting, you're, you're a king, you're supposed to be protecting our interests, but you're acting as a tyrant, protect, protecting your own interests, and these are the reasons why we think so. Uh, number one, and there's, and I'm gonna, I'm not gonna read all of these, but there's 27 reasons they listed here. 27 reasons. It wasn't, oh, you did this thing once to us. 27 different, distinct reasons, and some of them are vague, implying multiple th- events. Number one, he has refused to assent to laws, uh, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. Number two, he has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. So, his, remember, these guys were an ocean away. They didn't have iMessage back then. You know, they, they couldn't just get on FaceTime and say, King, listen, we got an issue. Said, listen, so, because sometimes there's urgent and pressing matters that need to be addressed. And they said, you have not given us, you've, you've established us as authority and leaders over these colonies, but yet we're not allowed to do anything without your consent, without you allowing it. And so then we have to put a, a letter to you telling you what the law that we want to enact for the safety and protection of these, and the operation of these colonies, send it by ship over, I believe it took like months to get there, and then months to get back. And they said, even when we did that, you ignored us. Talk about your great leadership figure. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, too, the, the government is set up to where these people are supposed to have to earn their jobs and be accountable to the people. They're not just, the jobs are not just given to them so that they have an accountability so they can't pull that kind of junk. I mean, they do anyways, but that's, that's the idea. Okay, let's go down. I'm going to skip some of these. Skip down. Okay, 
Number nine, he has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount of and payment of their salary. So basically, you've put judges in place to enforce your laws that are usurping our laws, and they're accountable only to you. They answer only to you. We have no power, no authority over them. So basically, he was using the judges to establish his own government there uh, in, instead of the colonial government which he had established previously. Uh, number 13, he has combined with others uh, to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution. They already had a constitution, by the way. Uh, it wasn't the constitution of the United States. It was a constitution of the colonies in collaboration with Great Britain. Uh, and unacknowledged by our laws, uh, giving his assent to their acts of uh, pretended legislation, for uh, quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial, by punishment from any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. So these phony judges were doing phony trials to protect the soldiers who didn't even need to be there. For cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, imposing taxes on us without our consent, depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, transporting us beyond the seas to be tried for pretended offenses. So false accusations, putting them on a ship, taking them all the way to Great Britain and, tr and giving them a trial there instead of giving them a trial in the colonies for things that they didn't even do. So this, is, this is some crazy stuff. This is hardcore. How many of you knew that all this went on? I didn't, I didn't even know, like, I, I kind of knew, but I was reading, I was like, man, I forgot how bad this was. I mean, this was, like, hardcore stuff. Okay, for abolishing the free system of English uh, laws in a neighboring province, establishing uh, therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries uh, so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument, uh, and fit instrument uh, for introducing the same absolute role into these colonies. Okay, let's see. There's so uh, uh, taking away our charters, uh, suspending our own legislators, overriding our our laws that we did, just pretending it's, it's like the, almost like they weren't even there. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty, and perfectly, uh, uh, and, per and cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in most in the most barbarous ages, and totally unworthy of the head of a civilized nation. Saying basically the stuff that you're doing, even the barbarous, the barbarous nations of history weren't this bad. And this is unfit for the, for the leader of a civilized nation. And, and it goes on. There's, there, like I said, there's 27. I'm just going to finish this. In every stage of, of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated pet petitions have been answered by only repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. And, and it goes on. I don't have time to finish reading the rest of it. I encourage you to read it. It's, it's quite interesting. So basically, we have 27 very good reasons why you're a tyrant and an unbiblical leader. And therefore, we feel it is right and necessary in our duty and obligation under God to separate and establish a God-fearing country. How dramatic. This is, these, the people that gave their lives to found this nation did so for, in, in a very dramatic time. And, and guys, you're talking about, I mean, this is the equivalent of, like, the state of Wyoming deciding, you know, we, we, we don't want to be part of the United States anymore. We're going to fight for independence. We'll take them out in a day. The, the, the. Great Britain was the world power of that day. And the colonies had li very limited ammunition, very limited uh, weaponry, ha hardly any training. They had no navy, no artillery, none of that. 
I mean, this is like, it's like a bunch of us deciding we're going to fight for independence for the city of Keller. <laughs> it's, I mean, the only way it's going to work is if God be for us who can be against this. It's the only way it's going to work. That's one of the reasons why I believe and I know in my, in my heart of heart that this nation was founded under divine direction of God. And, I, and let's, again, this nation is not perfect. But I'll tell you what, there's, I don't know about you, but there's nowhere else in the world I would rather live. And if you think you want to live somewhere else, you, you're wrong. <laughs> say, say, Venice may be pretty, but you don't want to live under that government. We separate, e- we separate ourselves so easily from God connections and set ourselves up for what we are trying to avoid, loss. Let us recognize in these terms that the God-given role of this nation is for the liberty and freedom of people protected by a government who would serve the people in the fear of Almighty God. This is why we have the balance of powers. We have the House and the Senate and the President and the Supreme Court. That's why the Supreme Court officials are not elected, but they're chosen by the President because the Supreme Court officials are supposed to be, or the judges, I should say, are supposed to be an unbiased uh, opinion on major matters that are related to the Constitution and, and, and other documents. That are, and the people that are not only going to be unbiased towards a specific party, but they're also supposed to be uh, free from the opinions of the people. They're the only part of the government that's not supposed to be affected by the opinions of the people so that if there is a majority of the people that's trying to hurt themselves by trying to establish a tyrannical government, they're able to step in and say, no, we're staying true to the, to the roots of the nation. That's not what they're doing today, but that's what they're supposed to be doing. In the House and the Senate and the presidency, that's why the, the House and the Senate have the ability to impeach and ultimately overthrow the president if they get enough votes by the will of the people in case that the president goes crazy and, and vice versa. There's, there's the balance of powers because they recognize that mankind, the, the human nature is well, – let me read exactly what I wrote because I, I wrote it down pretty good. Human uh, – the, the, the Founding Fathers knew what history has proven. Human nature seeks power for its own purpose, thinks it's of itself first, abuses power when profitable, and never wants to give it up. The human nature seeks itself first, abuses power when it's profitable for them, and never wants to give it up. They recognize this. That's why they have the balance of powers and all that. What is happening in our government today is tragic. We're seeing laws and legislations passed that are taking away the freedom that this nation has, allowed, um, has had for so many years, bit by bit and piece by piece. Uh, through taxes, reforms, immorality, immoral laws, and now even legislation that promotes demon- the demonic over the holy, Satan is robbing us of our influence, power, resources, and desire to continue funding the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read that last part again because it's just good, good stuff. Uh, Satan is robbing us of our influence, power, resources, and even our desire to continue funding the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, why do I say that? Because... We have a government that is constantly, I mean, every Christmas we get another state that refuses to call it a Christmas tree. Why? Why refuse to call it? Because it's Christ. It's Christmas. Then they call it a holiday tree. Now we got in the state of California, they're, they're banning, they're starting to ban uh, the, the nativity scenes in certain cities. You can't have a nativity scene because it might be offensive to somebody. But, but it's okay because we can still have a, a forever stamp that the post office just got directly from, ordered from Obama himself that is, it looks, like, it looks just like an artistic flower, but it actually is a Muslim symbol and it celebrates a Muslim holiday. We can have that on every letter you write. 
But God forbid we put a nativity scene out where the Muslims might see it. But you have to look at the Muslim flower. And that's the second Muslim stamp that Obama personally has ordered, by the way. And, uh, you know, we can, we, can, uh, we can let them build a mosque right next to the site of 9-11, but, you know, God forbid we let, Christ, uh, God forbid Obama go to church uh, on the first Sunday after getting uh, inaugurated as every other president in the history of this nation has done. You realize he was the first president to not go to church after getting inaugurated? What is happening in our government? And now you realize that if I come up here and say homosexuality is a sin, and it is, uh, that if you go out and commit a violent act against a homosexual, I get arrested, arrested for a hate crime. Did you realize that the state of California is uh, about to vote on, or has legislation has been proposed in the state of California that what bans the public usage of all Christ, Christian symbolism. Yeah, so all your cross necklaces and, yeah, all that has to go. Did you realize that the state of California has recently passed, this has already been done, uh, a legislation allowing in the public high schools for teenage boys and teenage girls to shower together. All you have to do if you're a boy and you want to go shower with all the girls, all the cheerleaders, is say, well, I think on the inside I'm really a girl. They say, oh, well, I guess you need to be in the girls' locker room then. It doesn't matter what your actual anatomy is. Yeah. Welcome to the United States of America, ladies and gentlemen. This stuff is happening right under our noses. Say, what do we do about this? Born, if you'd come, the worship team. What do we do about this? It's simple. There's only one thing we can do. We got to pray. And we got to pray hard. There's, I want to tell you guys that God hears and answers your prayers when you pray for his will to be done. He hears and answers your prayers. Now, I'm going to tell you this, just to be perfectly candid. It's, it is going to get worse. But by the grace of God, we can, we can delay it. Say, so why, why, why even worry about it then? Why delay it? Because there are millions and millions and millions and millions of people in America that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You realize there are people in America that don't even know who Adam and Eve is? I'm serious. We went out evangelizing one time and somehow the subject of Adam and Eve came out and they're like, who? We have nine billion people on the planet, half of whom have never even heard the name Jesus. We have a job to do. Amen? Amen. That's why the enemy, I believe that's why the enemy is fighting so hard to take this nation out and to bring us down to be just like the other nations. Because we are the largest funder of the gospel on the planet. We are the largest uh, uh, rec recruiter and sender of, of missionaries all over the world. If the devil shuts down America. He shuts down the spreading of the gospel in a big way. Now, God's bigger than America. He can find another way. But God has blessed this nation because he intends to use this nation for that purpose. So I say, God, I'm going to stand by you. I'm going to pray your kingdom come, your will be done. I'm going to pray for your purpose for this nation. And I'm going to do whatever I can, but either not just in the place of prayer, but giving financially and being an evangelist myself to live out the purpose you have for that nation because the call that God has in your life is bigger than you. It's bigger than you. It's all about Him. Amen? Let's stand.